All right. Well, I think this is everybody. Um, welcome back, guys, to uh, actually having confirmation again. Uh, I know that we had the retreat this this past month, um, and so the last time we met for one of these was December, and the last time we met in person was in November. So I'm really excited to see you guys again. Uh, I know our leaders really are too. Um, we're all be getting a little tired of the screen, so uh, it'll be so nice to see your guys' faces again. Um, we're just going to go ahead and uh, get started uh, so we can try and end a little early so y'all in the first group can make sure to get it here on time um, because we always uh, would love to be every, to everyone be on time. <laughs> um, so we don't want to go over this time around, especially because it's our first time back. Uh, so let's begin in prayer. So we'll begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, let your presence be known. Father, we thank you for bringing us here again on this uh, new day, this gift of Valentine's Day, and in preparation for the season of Lent. We ask that you open our hearts to listen to your word, that we continue to be disposed to your will, to seek you wherever you are found and to love others as they deserve because you loved us even when we didn't deserve it. Help us to be better Christians, better Catholics, and better people. Help us to serve one another as you have served us. Help us to love one another as you have loved us. And help us in the coming weeks as we continue to prepare for confirmation to continue to be emboldened by your Holy Spirit, uh, and to prepare for this sacrament. We ask this through the intercession of our Blessed Mothers. We pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So, just like uh, the theme of what we're doing, like I said, um, we are going to talk about Catholic social teaching today, which is something I think is a very uh, underappreciated little nugget of Catholic teaching um, that I'm so excited to share with you guys about. Um, it's just, it's so important to who we are as Catholics um, and what we actually do, because um, it's so easy to let our faith be about just believing in things, um, and we don't actually do anything about our faith. And that's not what Jesus wanted to do. Jesus was always doing things. God's always doing anything. Um, the whole Bible is about just God constantly acting to take care of the poor, the destitute, the needy, um, and he even became one of us just to show us how we can serve each other. Um, so we're going to start out with a nice little intro video on kind of a broad spectrum of what Catholic social teaching is, uh, and we will go from there. So let's see if technology bears with me this time. Love one another as I have loved you. This is the command that Jesus gave his disciples as the way they were to live once he was gone. For us as Catholics, it's the reason that we founded hospitals, schools, shelters. It's the reason that we donate our time, talent, and treasure. Loving one another means doing charitable things. But what if I told you that charity was only half of the story? And that as Christians, charity is incomplete unless it is lived out through justice. When we think about people doing charitable works, feeding the poor, caring for the sick, teaching the underprivileged, most people, no matter how they feel about the church or religion, will inevitably think of a nun in a habit or a priest in a Roman collar. This is partially conditioned by the movies and television we watch. Even in secular media, we often find traditional images of the church appearing when someone is in need. When society crumbles around them or a situation calls for selfless love, there is often a random and unidentified religious there to help. In a lot of ways, these traditional images of the church have become a sort of archetype of charity, even a cliché at times, for those helping the poor. And it's no wonder why. For Christians, charity is an essential aspect of living the gospel. Quite simply, the response of disciples to the uh, commandment of Jesus. 
that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so part of the task of being a disciple, or one might say the measure of being a disciple, is not only love of God, but also love of neighbor, which is charity. Charity is so intrinsic to our faith as Christians and the work we do as Catholics that the organization Catholics Come Home made it the main selling point of its 2009 commercial. With God's grace, we started hospitals to care for the sick. We establish orphanages and help the poor. We are the largest charitable organization on the planet, bringing relief and comfort to those in need. We educate more children than any other scholarly or religious institution. Overall, it's a fantastic commercial that highlights our good works, prayerfulness, diversity of members, and positive impact on history. And the organization has done a lot to produce positive and inviting images of the church for a popular audience. And yet there is one aspect of our faith completely missing from it, justice. When we say justice, we're not talking about lawyers and judges. We're not talking about doling out punishments. We're talking about the very biblical notion of giving each one what is rightfully due to them. The whole point about justice is, biblically speaking, it's about living in right relationship with God, with one another, and with creation. So how is this different from charity? It seems to me the whole point of justice is to deal not just with the effects or the outcomes of a situation, but to try to remedy and deal with the causes that bring about painful outcomes or consequences. Think about it this way. Say you go for a walk by the river and you find someone drowning. You decide to dive into the water to save them. In doing so, you have spent your time alleviating the effects of a painful outcome for someone. This is charity. But say this begins to happen a lot and you find yourself diving in the river four or five times a week to save someone. You begin to ask yourself, why are there so many people falling in the river that need saving? And what can I do to stop it from happening in the future? In doing so, you have spent your time alleviating the causes of a painful outcome for someone else. This is justice. In our world around us, there are many people drowning in a sense, dealing with poverty, violence, loneliness, oppression, and fear. As a church, we are obviously called to pull them out of the water of their condition. But we're also called to ask some important questions. What is it in our world that's causing these problems? And what can we do to fix them? Part of the task of us as Christians is simply to be concerned with what, what is the environment? And I don't just don't mean the physical environment, but what is the wider environment in which we are asking people to live their lives? Uh, if we care about people, we should care about the communities that we plant people in. We should care about the environments in which people are growing up. The Catholic Church has an extensive history of doing just that. Theologians like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas thought deeply about what a just society looked like, defining proper uses of money, authentic forms of government, even the conditions under which one could wage war. In the modern era, popes have written what are called social encyclicals, letters meant to be read by the whole church as a guide for building a just society based on the current issues. It is from these letters, built on the foundation of scripture and tradition, that we are guided by seven general principles of social teaching. We are called to care for God's creation, that which was created before us and we are a part of, to protect the life and dignity of the human person, to be active members of family and community, the building blocks of society, to uphold the rights and responsibilities of all people, but especially those who are poor, for which we have a preferential option, and those who are workers, all the while remembering that we are all in this together, in solidarity with all the people around the world. What's great about these principles is they are fairly broad categories to live by. The official church rarely, if ever, dictates specific or exclusive ways in which a Catholic is to live in the world because there are plenty of good and faithful ways to live as a Catholic in this world. What the church does dictate, however, is that a life of justice is required of all Christians. The 1971 Synod of Bishops wrote, Action on behalf of justice and participation in the transformation of the world fully appear as a constitutive dimension of the preaching of the gospel. Or, in other words, of the church's mission for the redemption of the human race and its liberation from every oppressive situation. And so what we're really saying is, if the Christian community lacks a commitment to justice, it's really not the Christian community, any more than it would be the Christian community if it lacked a commitment to reflection and prayer over the Bible, if it lacked a commitment to celebrate the Eucharist. Just as these things are essential to Christian identity, what the church maintains is being committed to justice has that same essential quality. 
if you want to be a Christian, you have to be concerned about justice. And how can you blame them? At its core, justice is simply an extension of charity, making sure our societal structures reflect our love for all people. There's nothing inherently controversial about seeking justice. Each of these principles is clearly rooted in Scripture and our tradition. And while we may disagree on how we are to live these things out, there shouldn't be a debate that we should. But really, is there anything not controversial in our world? I beg you, look for the words social justice or economic justice on your church website. If you find it, run as fast as you can. Social justice and economic justice, they are code words. If you have a, a priest that is pushing social justice, go find another parish. Go alert your uh, bishop and tell them, excuse me, are you down with this whole social justice thing? Everyone's fine with a nun handing out bread or a priest blessing the sick. But when someone begins talking about structures of sin or systems of injustice, eyebrows begin to rise. As Cardinal Dom Elder Camara, former Brazilian Archbishop, once said, When I give to the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why they are poor, they call me a communist. These sorts of questions challenge the status quo. And people with power, status, and privilege tend to like the status quo. When something challenges it, in their minds, it can't be true religion. Well, I can't speak to the exact reason that Glenn Beck finds social justice to be so antithetical to living the gospel. I can say that there is a common objection I hear from time to time. If the world will eventually pass away, shouldn't we be focused on saving souls, not the world? And I completely agree. Sort of. Well, I would remind us that we're not just souls. We are embodied spirits. If God becomes human and enters into the material conditions of humanity, if God takes on a body, if God lives the lives that you and I live as material creatures in history, we ought not to be too cavalier about being unconcerned about history or unconcerned about material conditions or unconcerned about the well-being of embodied people because that's precisely what God entered into. Exactly. Ultimately, we may be souls seeking salvation, but we know no existence without a body. Everything we do, everything we know, everything we believe is the result of living in this physical world. Sometimes the physical world can be oppressive, painful and without love, inhibiting our ability to authentically develop into the person God created us to be and effectively hiding the kingdom of God in our midst. In taking on flesh, Jesus did not just announce the kingdom of God with words, he made it present with his actions. He fed the poor, healed the sick, cured the blind. Wonderful acts of charity. But he also denounced the oppression of the religious leaders, included those who were excluded, and challenged the corruption of wealth. Jesus loved us in our physical reality and called us to do the same, through charity and through justice. Thanks to Father Ken Himes for sharing wisdom on this issue. What I shared was just the tip of the iceberg of our conversation. There was simply too much good stuff to fit in one video. If you're interested in learning more about Catholic social teaching or where you can read some of the social encyclicals yourself, check out the USCCB's website. Finally, if you haven't done it yet, click here to subscribe. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's, that just shows Catholic social teaching is such a huge, huge part of our faith. Um, but we don't really talk about it. We, we kind of generalize it and we kind of talk around it. Um, but I really wanted to give you guys the opportunity to learn about what the Catholic social teaching really is, because I think this is so super important, especially for me, because um, I'm I love doing things. I'm a doer. I, I don't just like to sit and talk around about, you know, like big ideas. Um, I like to go out and, and serve and take care of people um, and help the needy. Uh, because ultimately that's what Christ's calling us to do. He's not calling us to be a group of intellectuals. He's not calling only the smart people of the world to be Christians, uh, but he's calling all people. Um, and we do this through serving others. Um, and so... Love one another oh, as I no, love No, stop you. playing. Okay. There we go. Before we get into... Uh, like more the, the more the nitty gritty of what Catholic social teaching is, it's important to remember what the last meeting was because all of these meetings flow together. Um, 
And it's also been a while. It's been since December since we talked about this. So our last meeting, if you can remember, is about the sacraments and confirmation specifically. So we talked about what are the sacraments. They are outward signs of inward grace. So it's used to help attune our senses to what God is doing to us spiritually because we're, we're physical beings. We need things to see or things to hear or things to touch um, to help us know what's going on in the world around us. And so God uh, knows this about us because he created us. So in order to help us understand what's going on with us spiritually, he gives us these signs or these sacraments to help us know um, what's going on with that. Uh, Also, some of them leave an indelible mark. So that was that big word that we talked about, which just means that the, um, the amount of grace given through the sacrament is just so uh, immense that it completely changes the character um, of that soul permanently. So things like baptism, confirmation, and holy orders, these receive or these sacraments have indelible marks uh, because they're such a huge encounter with the grace of God that we uh, we we just are so changed by it that we can't receive this again. So that's why we only believe in one baptism, one confirmation, and one holy orders. Um, you can't do those ones again. You receive the Eucharist whenever you want. Uh, you can receive reconciliation whenever you want. Anointing of the sick, you can receive whenever you want. Marriage, if you get divorced or if your your spouse dies, uh, and you re- or or we don't believe in divorce, but we have annulments. Um, we can have marriage again, but baptism, confirmation, and holy orders, you can only have once, no matter who you are. Um, Also, because this is a confirmation course, we talked about what is confirmation. So we talked about how it's a completion of our baptism. So all the things that are started in baptism, either when you were born um, and you were a little baby, or if you came into it at a later age, um, all those fruits and the gift of the Holy Spirit that's given to us at baptism, we are sealed in it. So we receive it in all of its fullness, kind of like when you get a gift. Um, when somebody gives you a gift, um, it's not very, it's not a very good gift if we don't make use of it. And so confirmation is almost like the unwrapping of that gift given to us at baptism so that we can use them, um, these fruits of the Spirit, in their fullness and do what we are called to do Um with our vocation, in our everyday lives. Uh, Basically, it helps us become more real versions of who we're called to be because God's always trying to make us more human, not less. Um, That's why he became human himself. Uh, And then also, it's being claimed for Christ. So remember, we talked about how sacraments come from the the Latin sacramentum, which were uh, Romans pledging uh, themselves through a sacred oath of consecration uh, to a particular God to do something. And so these sacraments, the church understood this, took that, and then made it about real things about God. Uh, and so when we receive the sacrament of confirmation and, and the, the bishop anoints your head with the holy chrism, you're being claimed and marked for Christ with that indelible mark um, so that everybody, material and spiritual, uh, knows that you are one of God's children in creation. Also, just as much as confirmation is about you, it's also a lot about what the church is. Uh, so the, it's really a confirmation is a beautiful celebration of the church taking on a new member, uh, which it welcomes the confirmant into the church life. Uh, that's why you profess your faith in front of the entire congregation. Um, also, your, your, your church pledges to protect and serve your needs uh, and to take care of you. Um, and that's also beautiful because, you know, it's not just you saying, all right, this is what I believe and I'm going to do it on my own. No, Christianity is not a self faith. You're always doing Christianity with somebody else. Um, and that's why we have the church. So the church, because you're making this big statement takes you in. And then also the confirmants pledge to live out an active, not whatever that spelling is because I'm bad at spelling. Um, but an active life in the faith and service of God. So uh, you're given all these gifts, you're given the fullness of your life, uh, and now you got to do something with it. And that's what we're really going to talk about today with Catholic social teaching is, well, what do you do with your life when you have all the fullness of the gifts? 
in everything that's been God's been given to you, all these tools that you need to serve uh, the church. That's what Catholic social teaching is all about, is how do we serve for the church? And so we're going to scoot right on back to the initial screen here. Uh, with a, It's a quote from 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 7 through 11. Um, this is just, so Peter, you know, the first pope, the apostle Peter, um, is writing to some of the Greeks who are having a hard time figuring out, you know, what does our faith really mean? Um, and so Peter, he, he addressed he addresses this idea of, you know, keeping our faith just to ourselves and making it only about like intellectual stuff. Uh, he says here, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and sober for prayers. Above all, let your love for one another be intense because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever preaches, let it be with the words of God. Whoever serves, let it be with the strength that God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, who, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so Peter, he's making a really bold of- statement here. He's saying that everything that's been given to us is called to be used for the glory of God. Uh, and so these gifts of confirmation and sacraments, um, we too are called to do service for other people uh, so that we can bring glory to God, um, from which every good thing comes and to which everything returns. Something very important to think about, especially with Lent and Ash Wednesday coming up. Um, every good thing that's given to us is from God, and our gift back to God for that gift of life is what we do with it. Um And so now, where does Catholic social teaching really, really come from? Well, this is from the Gospel of Luke, um, and you guys probably know this. Uh, It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's a huge, huge reading. Most people talk about it. Even non-Christians know about it. Uh, But we're just going to read through it here. So um, Jesus is with his apostles in Galilee, just hanging out, doing their thing, preaching the gospel. Um, they don't really know what that is yet because Jesus hasn't died and resurrected, but it's okay uh, because Jesus is already here. So here's what Jesus says to somebody who's asking the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So there was a scholar of the law who stood up to test him and said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He said in reply, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your being, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He replied to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But because he wished to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man fell victim to robbers as he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. They stripped him and beat him and went off leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road, but when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. Likewise, a Levite came to that place, and when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion at the sight. He approached the victim, poured oil and wine over his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he lifted him up on his own animal, took him to an inn, and cared for him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, with the instruction, Take care of him. If you spend more than what I have given you, I shall repay you back on my, uh, repay you on my way back. Which of these, in your opinion, was neighbor to the vo- robber's victim? He answered, the one who treated him with mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Now, I love how sassy Jesus is in the gospel. Uh, He answers basically everybody's questions with an even better question and really reveals like what the true answer is. Um, But this is such an important part because there's, we could spend a whole entire talk going over just this little part of scripture right here but uh basically the levites uh and and the priests 
uh, were this royalty within Jewish culture, um, and they were to practice um, sacrifices in the in the temple. But if they went next to a, somebody who was half dead or beaten or blood, they would become ritually unclean, so then they couldn't practice. So these guys were worried about themselves, and they went on the opposite side of the road. But the Samaritan, the Jews did not like Samaritans. Uh, they had a long-standing rivalry, even though they kind of came from the similar backgrounds. Uh, and so people from Judea would actually go around Samaria just so they don't have to travel next to any Samaritans. Um, so Jesus is making a bold claim here that, uh, yes, we're called to love God with everything that we are. And yes, we need to call or we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. But when we are called to love our neighbors, it's not just the people next to us, but it's everybody, even the people we don't like, the, the rich, the poor, the powerless, uh, anybody need, is in need of something. And we are called to use what we have, even when it hurts us, uh, for the service of others. And so this is a very important part of scripture, which ties in to where we're going here for Catholic social teaching, which means... What does living out the Catholic life look like? Well, I've, I find there's two really big important parts about being Catholic. And that's believing and acting. So belief is all about what do we do? Uh, we're called to believe in our faith. That's, that's easy enough. You know, if you want to be Catholic, you kind of got to believe in, in what being Catholic is. Uh, so that also requires us to be learning the traditions and our practices of faith. You guys are here right now doing that exact same thing. So great job. Um, but also just in your daily lives, you know, trying to find God wherever he's found. Um, also, we're called to follow Christ and his teachings uh, because we're not just a dead faith, but a living one. So Jesus is alive. He is risen. Um, this is the good news that we preached. Uh, and so we have to take time to spend time with his word uh, and with him to fin figure out what we're called to do. And then we're also called to have hope in the second coming in the promise of heaven. So eventually or this world will end. It will pass away um, and we'll spend the rest of eternity in heaven if, uh, we, if, we, if we love God and keep his commandments. But notice how belief is only one half of the coin. Action is just as important as what you believe. So if you have a belief system that you don't act upon, you don't really believe what you believe uh, because actions back up our beliefs. Anybody can say they believe in anything, but if you don't actually do what you say you believe in, you're not really believing it. And so this is what Jesus calls us to do. So what are we doing as Catholics? We're called to proclaim the gospel message to others, to spread the good news, to spread uh, the church teaching, uh, the teaching of Christ, uh, that he is risen, um, that all sinners are saved in the eyes of God, um, and that we are called to love Jesus. Uh, and that's a hard thing to do, um, and that we, ooh, we can deny God's love for us uh, and spend the rest of eternity without him. Um, but why would we want to do that? If God has created uh, eternal uh almost this desire for everything. So we're always desiring new things in this world. Um, our desire is endless. So the only way to fulfill that endless desire within us uh, is another thing that's endless, which is God himself. Um, and so this is what we're proclaiming in the gospel. We also are called to participate in the sacraments. So those outward signs of inward grace. This is how we commune with God. This is how we l allow God to love us and how we love God back in return. Um, and it's just a beautiful way of having that physical sign of God's love um, and our love back for God. We also are called to pray and dialogue with God because, again, we're not a dead faith. We have a real God, a live God. He wants to talk to you. He wants to spend time with you, whether that's in the sacrament of Eucharist and in adoration or just in your own room when you're praying and you, have, you feel like there's nothing else you could do but just kind of hope and pray. God is there, and he wants to talk to you. Um, we also have to live up to our vocation and the call to sainthood. So we're all called to be saints. We're all called to go to heaven. Um, and God has a specific plan for each one of us to go to heaven. Um, but we have to live up to that. We can't just sit around and do nothing. Uh, otherwise, we won't make it to heaven. Heaven's a journey. Um, it's a way. Jesus says, I am the way. So the whole way to heaven is heaven himself. 
Uh, next, we're also called to serve others who are taking care of their needs because not everybody is born into this world with all the needs that they have. In fact, most people aren't. And so people who do have abundance are called to share that uh, for the service of others. Because this ties into the ultimate message, loving others, especially when it's hard. So giving of ourselves to everybody around us, even to the people that we don't like, um, even to the people that it's hard to love, uh, we're still called to love them uh, because we are loved when we're the exact same way by God. So next, what is Catholic social teaching? Um, well, we're just kind of breaking down the each part of uh, what that means. So it's Catholic. So it's rooted in the Catholic tradition, um, and everybody's called to it because what is Catholic mean? It means universal. So it's a universal call to everybody. It's also social. So what does that mean? Well, it's others focused because again, our faith isn't just about us. Our faith inherently needs a community um, and we're called to focus out of ourselves to remove us from the equation almost uh, and to kind of uh, move out from just focusing about what I need and what I want and see the needs of others and take care of that because we love them. Um, and it's a reminder that we're all part of this mystical body of Christ. So Jesus and St. Paul talks about how we're all members of Jesus's body. Um, and there's a beautiful quote by one of the saints that has said, uh, Christ has no hands or feet to take care of the poor in this world, but you No, uh, no feet to walk to the ends of the earth, but yours, no hands to deliver, uh, the needs of to the poor except yours, no ears to hear the cries of the suffering but yours. Um, and I think that's a beautiful message of, you know, we all have integral parts to play towards the service of God um, because we are part of that mystical body. So we are all united in Jesus, in his body. And that doesn't have to look the same way for everybody. So a hand doesn't make a very good eye. Um, and a hand should never try to be like the eye because it won't work out. You're not going to see anything out of this. And likewise, I shouldn't be grabbing things with my eyeballs. Not only is that freaky and gross, but it sounds a little painful. Um, we're all called to be different uh, parts of the same mission. And so we all have different gifts in order to use and serve uh, the same mission in Christ. So God wants you to be more you because he created you to be you. Uh, he didn't create you to be the next somebody else. He created you to be you. And so we are really living out our vocation um, and our livelihood if we become who we are created to be. And now finally, teaching. Uh, not only is it just teaching in the sense like I'm telling you guys about it um, and I'm part of the church, but it's also part of our mission to teach and preach the gospel. Um, St. Francis of Assisi talks about how, uh, you know, uh, preach the gospel at all times, but when necessary, use words. Um, our teaching is in our service. It's putting our money where our mouth is and saying, you know, like, I believe in this. And so I'm going to live it out. I'm going to show you how this belief actually works. Um, and so that's what Catholic social teaching is all about. Um, and then finally, before we have our witness, um, just going over the brief uh, kind of overviews of the, the central tenets of Catholic social teaching. So first, life and dignity of the human person. This is the first, it's the primary. If you don't have life, you have no opportunity to uh, serve other people and to be served. Um, God has uniquely and beautifully made every person uh, in this world. And so before we take care of anything about them, we have to make sure that they have a life and a life worth living. And so from conception to natural death, the church stands uh, and says, we will protect that life. Um, we're not just pro-birth and we're not about euthanasia or the death sentence. Uh, the church is pro all life. And so this it's so fundamental because uh, we can't do all the rest of these until we have this person who's alive. Um, but where do we come into life? We don't come into life just kind of like, we don't pop into existence. Um, not even God did that. You know, God chose to be born into a family. And so we're called to be born into families. And so when we have our own families, we're called to serve our family and ultimately 
our bigger family, which is our community, and participate that in and serve within it uh, and to love each other within that. Now, once you know you become a more of a functioning uh, human being, now you start to recognize, wow, I have rights. Okay, I have things like I have a right to life. Um, I have right to water and food, um, to uh, being taken care of, to be loved, um, to have a job. Uh, but with every right that we get, the church also recognizes like we have a responsibility to do that. Um, and so if I have a right to life, I also have a responsibility to make sure that I respect that dignity of being alive to other people and being, everybody's being made in the image of God. And so I have a responsibility to protect that person's right um, and to recognize them and to take care of them, which moves into the next one, option for the poor and vulnerable. Uh, there are people in this world, again, who are born into poverty, into slavery, uh, into dictatorships, into places where they don't have freedom to live out their lives. Um, there are people being martyred for their faith uh, in the Middle East and in uh, Asia uh, simply because they want to believe um, what they want to. And this is not just, you know, poverty in the sense of you not having money or food, um, but like mental poverty, people who have problems with mental health or social poverty, people who are isolated, alone, uh, abandoned, you know, we're called to respect and take care of everybody. And so we have to be going out with, uh, take with the, with it in mind to take care of these poor and the vulnerable. Um, also, another beautiful thing about Catholic social teaching, which is really cool to think about, you know, the dignity of work and the rights of workers. Um, the church has a beautiful understanding of work in the sense that uh, we partner with God in creation. And so God created us to be good stewards and co-creators with him. Uh, so we have a right to work. We have a right to help God create. We have a right to to make something beautiful that did not exist before, but could exist forever. Um, and so we have a beautiful, beautiful teaching that, you know, w it helps people be more human in order to have something to work towards, whatever their desire is and whatever they need to contribute to the world. You know, they have that right and, the, and it's dignified in that work. Um, solidarity is kind of like what the priests were talking about in the video about how, um, uh, it's not just about doing the right things and taking care of right people, but making sure that we recognize we're all in this together. Um, we're taking care of each other because we're brothers and sisters of Christ. Um, and we need to be making sure that we're creating systems and communities and societies that support all of these teachings, that every life is sacred, that every life needs to be taken care of. And making sure we don't create systems that oppress or isolate or um, discard people from society because that was not Christ was all about bringing people together. He was never about tearing people apart. Um, and so solidarity is super important to Catholic social teaching in the sense of it's also one of the hearts of our message. You know, if we're if we're doing some things for other people and not taking care of others who are in need, we're we're missing the message completely. Uh, and then finally. We have care for God's creation. So everything created by God is beautiful because it was made by God and he deemed it good. And so if we're stewards of God's creation, um, we have that right to take care of God's creation. And it's also our responsibility to take care of it because if God liked it and he made it, you know, that's got to be pretty important uh, because if God didn't think it was important, he wouldn't have made it. Um, and so we have to also take care of God's creation. So, you know, making sure we're not abusing resources or polluting the environment. Uh, we have to take care of our earth, not only because it's the only one that we got, but it's made by God. It's holy. It's made. Uh, Jesus came here. God became a man to be on this earth. So if he thought it was that important, uh, we darn better well uh, should also. So now... Uh, we're going to have a great witness by Rachel uh, talking about what service and Catholic social teaching uh, means to her. All right. Thanks, Kyle. Um, so I'm sure most of you are required to do service for school or clubs you're in, whatever. So it's been the same way for me ever since I was in middle school. Um, and I'm actually still, uh, I still have required service hours even in college. 
Um, so when I was younger, I, I wondered why we even had these requirements. I, I was always thinking like, wasn't just going to Catholic school and going to church every weekend good enough, like for being a good Catholic. But as I've grown in my faith, I've learned why doing service is so important. So I'm going to share my experience with all of you guys. So as Catholics, we're called to be disciples of Christ. So this doesn't mean just speaking your faith. It means showing your faith with your actions. And we're called to bring justice to the world. So a great way to do this is through acts of service. So I've had the privilege to be able to travel to other places with um, other young people to do service projects. Um, so one of the places that I've gone to several times is called Nazareth, Nazareth Farm. So at Nazareth Farm, you spend a week doing um, a retreat and then do, you do like various service projects for the people in the West Virginia community. So um, while they teach you about the importance of service there, they also teach you other things like um, how important it is to create a community and to follow simplicity and to pray while you're doing service with other people. So at Nazareth Farm, I, I learned that um, serving others isn't just about doing something to help someone, but it's also about um, getting to know the person that you're helping and letting them know that they're created with dignity and in God's image. So at Nazareth Farm, I also learned that um, doing acts of service is very spiritually fulfilling because you know that you're going out and you're showing exactly what it's like to love like Jesus. Um, so another organization that I've gotten to be involved with is called Catholic Heart Work Camp. So um, similarly at Nazareth Farm, you go and you spend a week doing service projects uh, with other young people uh, but this one is different because it's less retreat-like and it's more summer camp-like. So in the, the week that I spent there most recently, we had mass every single morning. And then there were also um, morning and night program sessions where people would like put on skits and just do other like fun, silly things to get fired up about like doing service and just about being together in a faith-based community with other young people. So um, this taught me that doing service can be one of the most exciting and fun experiences of your life. You just have to let yourself be open to it and you just have to create it into a fun environment with your peers while you serve. Um, so the last time I went to Catholic Heart, um, I got to work for Habitat, or Hab sorry, I got to work with Habitat for Humanity. So if you don't know what that is, it's an organization that builds houses free of charge for people who need it, but they just ask that the person who the house is being built for put in a certain number of hours to help build it. So this, that aspect of it taught me the importance of solidarity. Um, so we worked with the lady who was going to receive the house and we were all working together for the same purpose, which was to make her life better by giving her a house. So this was a really good example of solidarity to me. So solidarity is an important concept when we're thinking about justice because it means um, creating unity for all while supporting, loving, and just being inclusive of everybody no matter what. So through my service experience, I've been able to practice solidarity by just doing my best to improve other people's lives, um, even with something just as simple as like passing out hot dogs to people who are experiencing hunger or homelessness or helping paint someone's house who couldn't do, the, do it themselves or helping teach summer camp at a school that needed help. So I think it's important for all of us to learn these concepts of justice and human dignity and solidarity through our actions rather than just discussing them. So as I've said, um, I learned each of these things by doing service and it's really opened my eyes and it's taught me that whenever I see someone who needs help, I just remember that they are a human and they deserve respect just like everybody else. So doing these like larger scale service projects um, has also led me to do smaller acts of service just in my everyday life. Like examples of this would be um, keeping granola bars in my car to give to people who are homeless who I um, see on my commute home often, or just um, like giving my change to someone who asked for it just so they can meet their basic human needs. Um, so I think overall doing service is really important because you get excited about helping other people and then you'll start looking for smaller ways to bring justice to the world whether it's through large or small acts. So um, if you are someone who finds it difficult to start doing service and start going out and helping people, um, I highly suggest finding someone who you look up to, um, who loves doing service. So for me, uh, one of my role models of service was um, the old youth minister at St. Pius. Um, his name is Craig. So Craig helped me grow in my faith because he was the one who introduced me to Catholic Heartwork Camp. And um, 
we we've been good friends because we kept doing service projects together and he always kept motivating me to keep keep going back keep doing more service projects because he knew it was so important to me um so one of the most important lessons that i learned from craig was that even if you aren't feeling 100 percent in your faith life you can still show goodness to other people um, you don't have to be perfect before you can show god's love so you just have to try your best to just be who God created you to be, and then you can still go out and pursue justice. So to sum up everything I've told you today, um, doing service is really important for us to learn hands-on what it means to be a disciple and to bring justice to the world. So uh, while your service projects vary, they essentially all boil down to understanding human dignity in every person and knowing that it's your duty to help other people. Um, doing service creates uh, community, so um, you can make really great friends, um, especially friends in the same faith as you, friends in the church, um, and these can end up being some of the most important people in your life. And finally, doing acts of service is essential to our faith because it's one of the best, most tangible ways for us to go and spread God's love around the world. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for that witness. That that that's just perfect. Uh, that's really what uh, Catholic social teaching is all about. It's recognizing, you know, like everybody's dignified, and that you can help them realize their own dignity through serving them, and at the same time, you realize your own dignity through that service too. Um, and you both get to be holier just through doing good things to each other. Isn't that awesome? God makes it so easy for us to become holy, but it's so hard for us to want to do it. Um, that's why Catholic social teaching is so uh, powerful to me. Also, uh, I love the point at the end there where she makes about uh, how you don't have to go out to huge service events to uh, take care of people. St. Teresa of Calcutta, one of my favorite saints, uh, she talks about how uh, she was asked by an interviewer about, you know, uh, how do you live out the gospel message um, in today's world? Uh, and she told this interviewer, find your Calcutta. Um Calcuttas are all over the world. Um, they don't have to be um, in the out or in the in the, the wastelands or the out the most impoverished places of the world. Um, you can find people of need right where you are, um, and that's what's helped me with my service projects. Uh, going out uh, into Indianapolis, taking care of uh, uneducated uh, children, um, but even you know in my own family, there's need. My friends, there's need. Um, everybody has a need, um, and Christ calls us to help people take care of it because uh, that's what we're called to do. We're called to love each other. Um, and with that, uh, we're going to have some great discussions in small groups because I know you guys are excited to actually see each other in person again. Uh, and so, uh, like always, groups one through three are going to come uh, here at four o'clock. Um, it's okay if you're a little bit late because I know it takes a while to get here. Uh, and then groups four through six will come uh, from five to six o'clock. Um, make sure that you guys um, also check your emails because I have service opportunities for you guys. You already got all the requirements you needed um, earlier, but for the small groups, if you are looking to join one of those, we're going to have Lenten small groups um, starting uh, next Tuesday. Uh, and those are just going to be about like Bible reflections, talking about Lent and stuff like that. Uh, but also we're going to have uh, guys and girls groups. We're going to have a service group. Uh, we're going to have an apologetics and leadership group. Um, so that's all about like, how do you become a real leader in Christ? And also like, how do you defend the faith? How do you talk about the faith in every day? Um, and yeah, so I, there's a lot of really good opportunities for you guys to do service. Um, and small groups are one of those ways. And uh, yeah, with that, you guys can go ahead. And we'll see you here in a little bit. Catch you later.